Hey, excuse me. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tim Travels. I'm your host, Terry, coming to you from Confederate Avenue in the Gettysburg National Military Park. Um, I'm not really going to show anything. Well, actually, I will. I will show something here. So if you want to know what the Confederate artillerymen were looking at on um, the early afternoon of July 3rd, 1863, um, this is kind of what they saw. So there's a there's a smooth bore artillery piece. But if you look through those trees there, um, that other ridge about a mile away is cemetery ridge and we're looking right towards where the union center was in fact the um i don't know if it's visible but there's a there's a tree that's kind of big and it's by itself out there and that was one of the points that the uh the confederate infantry was told to uh oops sorry uh told to you know kind of guide on um you know, head for that. So anyway, I'm just here. My wife had a meeting in Gettysburg, so I had a little bit of time and I thought I'd do a, a video kind of follow up. Let me first say that um, I so, so appreciate all the people that have reached out to me. I've gotten phone calls, texts, um, a lot of people in comments reaching out to me, wishing me well. And, you know, commenting on the state of things at at prime and you know and i you know what they've experienced maybe they've left maybe they're still there um but i i will say that i i wanted to kind of you know throughout my life i've done things where um i i've done things that turned out great and i've i've done things where my experience wasn't so great. But I really try to learn something from every one of those experiences because I feel like if you don't look, take a hard look at something that happened that was maybe negative, then you don't, you know, it was, it was worthless. And I don't want, you know, life is short. Um, even if you live a long time, life is kind of short. And I don't want to have, um, well, first of all, I don't like making the same mistakes twice. And I certainly have done that in the past, but I've also avoided it, you know, from time to time. And the other thing is you don't want to go through an experience and then, you know, not benefit from it, even if it was overall, it was negative. And, you know, I've, I've said this to people in the past that I, I, I learned something from almost every boss I ever had, whether it was what to do or what not to do, how to treat people, how not to treat people. Um, and so, you know, I, I try to, I try to like, when the kind of the dust settles, sit back, <clears throat> kind of take stock of what happened or, you know, how things went. And so that's what I kind of want to do in this video is just like talk it out and say, okay, here are the things that um, I thought went well at Prime, both maybe for me, well, both for me and maybe for others. And here's the things that didn't go well and mistakes that I made. And, you know, by sharing that, I, you know, I used to listen to my dad and my dad you know, I didn't always listen to my dad because I was a kid, right? No kid always listens to their dad, I, I don't think, um, or their parents. And I, but I took to heart some of the things my dad said when I was a kid and things that he had done or not done that he wishes he had a chance to do over. And of course, you don't have a chance to do over, but what I, one of the things that, I took away from that is you're going to meet people throughout your life who tell you, Oh, I wish I had done that. Or I wish I hadn't done that. Now you, of course you have to take that with a grain of salt. 
there might have been somebody that was like, hey, I was, you know, five, six, and I really couldn't dribble a basketball, but my dream was to play in the NBA. So I threw all my eggs into that basket. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe they didn't succeed because of factors outside their control. Uh, and maybe they should have just picked a different sport or, or you know, and, and, and that's the important thing is that to remember is not everybody's going to be good at everything. And sometimes it's not just getting the right people on the bus. It's getting the right people that are, are getting the people on the bus in the right seats. And maybe we don't always find that correct seat to sit in. So uh, with that in mind, you know, let me just say that my original like experience with with onboarding at prime was um it was pretty seamless but i was really kind of surprised that they would bring a driver like me in and immediately you know like you do a bunch of cbt's then you get on the simulator the video game whatever you want to call it and once you do that, you know, and your drug test comes back, they're like, oh, here, you're, you're an A seat and you can lease a truck and you can do this. I, it, it, was, it was weird to me because I had never not had like a check ride at, at a company when I went there, even if the company was of decent size. And so that was a little bit weird to me. Um, but, you know, it seemed like things were you know, done well. Um, but I really, I, I really could say that when I finished the CBTs, I don't really think I was prepared for, um, what I was going to face at, coming from dry van, um, in, into being on re, you know, in a reefer division. So I, but I kind of figured things out and, and I figured out the reefer kind of on the fly how to work it. And, um, cause I think the first load I picked up, um, first few loads I picked up maybe were they were drop. Well, the first load I picked up was, um, a candy load and I delivered to Costco and it was kind of funny because my, um, my fleet manager thought I had service failed. Um, because there were actually two deliveries at Costco. And the second one, I wasn't really on time for because I was just getting unloaded at a different loading dock. And, and well, what I thought was a different loading dock. And then they were just like, oh yeah, we'll just do it all. So I hadn't like checked in at the second delivery, the second stop. Um, so it, it worked out. And then my second load was a drop and hook. And that's the load I first got a claim on. Um, in fact, I think that was the, that was, that was the only claim against me, um, on a load. And it was actually, it was my second load. I picked up a load of vegetables in Vineland, New Jersey, and took them to Washington courthouse. And that load was supposed to be a live unload, but it turned out to be a drop and hook. So that I learned a lesson on because I had to go because I didn't have the tank on the reefer full because I was like, oh, you know, they're just going to unload me. I'll fill it up when I'm finished. But then they were like, oh, this is a drop and hook. And um, that was unfortunate for two reasons, because then I had to leave and go over by I-71 and get fuel. But again, learned a lesson, you know, fill up before you go. And um, just in case. And the other thing that I learned was, you know, it was unfortunate that I didn't have a live unload because I never opened those trailer doors and I didn't even know what, like I knew what they said about the claim, but I didn't know what it really looked like. Um, and you know, if I do some damage or I do something wrong, I want to learn something from it. But because it was a drop and hook and, you know, and I told my fleet manager, I said, hey, I said, you know, when they don't show you anything, 
it, it really kind of bugged me that they could just say, oh, here, you know, this was messed up. I'm like, how do you know the jockey didn't do it? I mean, the way the way jockeys move things around and, and you know, and I'm not saying that that I wasn't responsible for it. I'm just saying I don't know that I was responsible for it. And, you know, the penalty always falls on the driver. And, and I felt like... And so if that's a neg, if the penalty falling on the driver is a negative, I really feel like that was one of the big negatives at, at prime, like, um, no driver in my, in my experience, no drivers never got the benefit of the doubt. And even when you're just kind of looking out for yourself, um, it's like, it's like you are you know, it's like you're not the team player. Um, so that, that was a little bit new to me because I think I told this story before where my, like I had a problem at a shipper one time when I was at night and my, my terminal manager was basically like, screw them, you know, just leave. And he still paid me for the, you know, for going to that shipper. So I, I was not used to, Net, you know, I, I always own my mistakes, but I was not used to never getting any support. Um, and you know, I understand quote, the customer is always right, but let's be honest, the customer isn't always right. And, um, you know, I, I, and believe it or not, I think that companies that stick up for their drivers really will ultimately have a better relationship with the customer. Um, you know, if you own something you do, they're going to respect that. But if you push back when, when one of their people says something, um, when you don't think it's true, if you have your driver's back, but, and, and let me say this about having a driver's back, the driver has to have integrity. The driver has to have covered their bases. But you know what I learned from that incident? Every single time I moved a load of almost anything, if I, if I thought a load bar needed to go in the back, I would put a load bar in there. If I thought two, then two, three, then three. And I always took pictures. I always took pictures. And um, I remember one time getting a drop and hook. So it was preloaded. And I took man, I, I opened the doors and I was like, this is a kind of a mess. It was, um, it was, I think it was ice cream, but man, it was just not stacked well or anything. And of course it was sealed when I got it. So I took pictures and I warned my fleet manager. I said, there might be a claim on this because there were a lot of stuff that was like kind of crunched and everything. Cause it had tipped over and got caught in between pa pallets that were swaying. And to, much to my surprise, uh, the dudes, it was, it was delivery up in Michigan at some like dairy company and, um, maybe Highland. Um, anyway, they, they came out, brought the bills. I'm like, everything cool. He's like, yeah, it's fine. We got it. Like they were just used to it. And so they, they didn't say anything, made my life easier. So, um, you know, I liked the way I like prime terminals. Um, but I feel like there were you know, that's the positive. Generally speaking, I liked the terminal. What I didn't like at terminals was the inbound process, the, you know, huge weights, depending on where you were. Um, I didn't, I didn't care for, you, you know, it's like one time I, I tried to get fuel at the Petro right down the road from the exit for the Pittston terminal. And I went there cause I was in a hurry. And I was like, yeah, I just need to throw some fuel in this because I, I was heading up into New York State. And I got there and, you know, just all I had all sorts of problems. Like the first pump didn't work. Second pump wouldn't take my card. I go inside. They couldn't get it to run. I call the fuel desk and they're like, well, you can't fuel there because it's too close. You're, you should. Why didn't you go to the terminal? And I'm like, are you kidding? Like the reason I wouldn't go to a terminal is because I was in a hurry. Like the people in inbound take forever. And, you know, that's, that's the crazy thing 
is while, you know, I appreciated the food service and the bunk rooms I used occasionally. And, you know, like I said, the gyms, the, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the amenities at the terminals, chiropractor or whatever. What I didn't like is that getting, going to the terminal is like getting into a trap that you can get out of, but you don't know how long it's going to take you to get out of that trap. And when you're in a hurry, that's the last place you want to stop for fuel. Last place. And in fact, I remember one time I picked up a trailer that needed fuel in in um, in Springfield. And so I go through Outbound. I'm like, hey, I, I need to fuel this trailer. They're like, oh, we don't we our fuel pumps are down or whatever. I don't know what the issue was. So I end up going over to come and go like right down the street. And I think I was, I was dropping at the caves. So it's not like I was going to run down the road a hundred miles and go past some other truck stops. I end up feeling a come and go out of pocket just to get, be able to drop this trailer off. And, you know, it's like, again, it, it was one of those things you know, it didn't matter that I went to come and go because Prime didn't even really know about it. I mean, I told my fleet manager, but whatever. And, you know, that's a negative, right? Like when people feel like they avoid the terminal, they avoid their own company's terminals. That's a that's a big negative. And, and, and I can't tell you how many times I would say, oh, I'm at the terminal and people are like, are you crazy? So, you know, that's that's just one of those things. And you know, so good, bad. There's two sides to every coin, right? You know, there were times where I thought my fleet manager was, you know, killing it for me, but there were a lot of times and, and that was good. But what I, what I came to realize was that when, when he was killing it for me, he was killing it for himself. And, you know, I talked about, <clears throat> I talked about the conversation I had with my fleet manager and this other guy from prime over the Christmas video. And one of the things that the, uh, you know, Stan Almond said was, well, you know, you're a good driver, your fleet manager, you know, you're very productive and profitable and stuff, but you just do these videos. And, you know, it was interesting to me because I think even at that point, if I'd have been not a profitable driver, if I'd have been a guy that had service failures if I didn't have some safety, you know, awards, like I, I, I did a snapshot on the, um, on the app, uh, right before I got back to Springfield the last time. And I have like all of these, uh, PTC awards that I never picked up hats and shirts and blankets and I don't know, key fobs, you know, stadium pillows or whatever. And then I, there, there was a safety one on there too. And my, and my original safety one, I think I gave the jacket to my son and I do have some of the PTC shirts, but the funny thing is, and this is kind of my, almost my anti-establishment bent is that I really don't feel like, like getting stuff like that is, it, it, it just feels weird to me because I'm like, wait a minute, delivering stuff on time is your job. And I always thought, I mean, I, I can safely say that in five years of over the road trucking, nearly five years, um, cause I'll, it, it's five years next month. Um, I, I mean, maybe, maybe a, a handful of times. Like I could count on one hand the times I service failed. Um, I know I did. I service failed once at GP Transco because I, I didn't take. The GP didn't really care the rec what route you took as long as you got there, and I ignored their recommended route, and it was, it was a lot longer. Like it was a, it was it was at least. It was probably two hundred miles farther than the route they had. Um, they had suggested, but the route they suggested went through West Virginia. And I was like, I was just did not want to drive through West Virginia, but it was like a load going quite a ways. It was like from Georgia up to Minnesota. And, um, yeah, I took a more Southerly route and I got up to the terminal. I was like, mm, I'm not going to make this, but, um, you know, so, 
service failure to me was, you know, just not an option. Um, and as far as safety goes, again, you know, that's your job. Everybody, people have incidents. I certainly have had them. Um, but, you know, day in and day out, right? Safety is your job. Delivering stuff in good condition and on time is your job. So, like I said, I had a claim. I had one service failure, but... Um, so, you know, I, I think that I, I think that on balance that, you know, prime made money from my efforts and, um, you know, I made money from my efforts, but over the long run and really, and, and, and I've said this too, but, but one of the, one of the good things I did was I kept my freight liner longer than the lease. I went past what they the success has this term they call the natural lease end. Um, I don't know. Natural is not a word I would use with a contract, but whatever. Um, and they'll let you keep that lease. And, and let me say this, if I had to do it over again, because I, especially because I wasn't buying a truck, but if I had to do it over again, I would have never ordered the truck. I just had the Peterbilt never ordered that. Um, I would have just been like, what else you got? And I would have gotten some freight liner. And if you can churn those leases every year, year and a half, two years, if you stay a long time, um, that'll be lucrative for you. Um, because you are getting lease completions under your belt and those are valuable. Um, and because you're getting a pile of cash at the end of every lease. And even if it's not, obviously it's not going to be as big if you only lease for a year as it would if you lease for three years, but there's a time value of money and that's a holdback for, um, you know, on that contract. Um, the other thing I would do is, you know, that it also always puts you in a position to be able to take a big, pile of time off and in between leases it also puts you in a position where if you do decide to leave um you know you are you're closer to being finished um on your terms so the other thing though that i did that i and i would recommend it is always you know take the ace two class every couple of years why? Because you get to defer a lease payment. When I, when I left Prime last week, um, I had, I had, because I did, they wanted me to go back through PSD training. So I went back through ACE 2 and then I went through PSD training. Well, ACE 2, I deferred a lease payment and that wasn't paid back yet. There's still, I don't know, like 800 bucks left on that. And then I also deferred my fixed costs um, and there was a balance on that of a couple, like 228 bucks. The other thing that happened that, I mean, I didn't really plan it this way, but it's kind of fortuitous. They took a load off me because I didn't want to wait for it, but they left it on my, they left it on my like dispatch or on my loads. And so that's the, that's the trip number I used for fuel going from California back to Missouri. And that did not show up on my statement. And, uh, yeah. So I don't know how much fuel that was probably 400 bucks. So I'm not saying I like, <laughs> I'm not saying I got all rich or anything. I'm just saying I took advantage of what was given to me. Um, and you know, they're going to take advantage of whatever they can. Um, I should take advantage of whatever I can. And that's what I recommend to people. Um, I will say that, that, um, you know, overall I had, I had a, I, I don't want to say I had a horrible experience at prime cause that's not really true. I had a, on a scale of one to five, five being like awesome. And I named my, I'm naming my next born kid, Robert Lowe. Um, and one being, you know, I'm going to try to run everybody at prime off the road. If I can, I, I had like a three, 
I had like a three. There were there were times where it was it was really good. And, you know, I, I think what happens is when things get tough, you find out what people are made of. And I feel like I always took one for the team. I always did repowers. I always took crap loads. I was willing to train even against my best judgment. And, you know, was I rewarded for that? Mm, not really. But if I had to do it again, I probably still would have made the same choices because that's just how I kind of roll. And so I'm not going to regret being a, a team player. I'm not going to regret, um, you know, wanting to be helpful. I'm not going to regret, you know, you know, I, I just don't go through, I, I learn, but I don't, but I don't have a lot of regrets. You know, there's a lot of things I wish I did different. Um, maybe on this last load, I should have just let my trainee, you know, be as late as he wanted to, because I was, because I was going to kick him off the truck. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, you know, even in the moment I was like, you know, should I do this or not? And I was like, you know what, at some point you just got to say enough is enough. And if that, if me saying enough is enough made them think enough is enough with him because we already want to get rid of him, then, Hey, you know, I, uh, I maybe uh, drove into a trap, but I'm not really worried about it. Um, and as for what I'm doing next, I don't know. I'll figure it out. My, I have had thoughts of just getting on unemployment and going through the process of getting disability for some of the stuff that happened to me in the military that I've just ignored over the years. Um, so who knows? But uh, I have thrown out some fillers. Like I said, a lot of people have reached out to me, so I appreciate that. And, you know, I'll just figure out what happens next. Um, and... You guys will be the first to know. So I'm going to enjoy the battlefield for a little bit longer and then go pick my wife up from her meeting. And uh, yeah, just enjoying my time at home. So anyway, if you're on the road, be safe. Um, watch the weather and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.